Hello, everyone. I'm talking to the room. Yay. All right. So we're here for the Bullet Lecture. I, uh, I'll, I'll do a brief introduction of uh, Marshall Bullet. I kind of went down the biography uh, rabbit hole uh, this afternoon. He's a really fascinating guy, and he's a lawyer and a mathematician, which I thought was a fantastic poly polymath um, <clears throat> kind of um, person. So, right. In uh, 1958, he bequeathed the uh, Bullet uh, Rare Book Collection to U of L, and he, the, the, in, in his honor, the Bullet Lectures were set up. And so we are incredibly honored to have um, Rory Watkins here for uh, his uh, grandson uh, for this Bullet Lecture. And um, but before we start on this excellent talk, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, have uh, Laurie hand the. Uh, Bullard Scholarship Award and the Bullard Memorial Award to um, a deserving astronomy student uh, for this year. So, Ori, would you like to do the honors? All right, so the uh, William Marshall Bullard Award in Astronomy, which is uh, outstanding promise in astronomy and astrophysics, is awarded to Sean Cannell. Sean, would you like to come up here, please? <laughs> paper in astronomy by an undergrad is also for Sean Knobel. He did a double <laughs> hat trick today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I was taught speeches should be short. That's their best quality. Um, so, uh, without too much further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this uh, evening, uh, Bob Williams. He is, uh, has a very long resume, so if I'm dropping something, sorry. Uh, he was a uh, professor in Arizona. He was the director of Ceratolo um, Observatory in Chile, and he was the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute. So that's a, a long resume, but just to top it all off, he is also uh, the driving force behind the picture that he will be talking about. Uh, I've known him from my time in Space Telescope. Um, I'm looking around the room, but I can't recognize anybody because there's a light in there, so I hope Bob's here somewhere. Yeah. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I've known him from my time in Space Telescope. He's a uh, very, very good astronomer. And uh, please give it up for Bob Williams, our bullet lecture for 2019. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Halloween. Um, the subject that I want to talk about tonight uh, sounds a bit grandiose because it is science at the grandest scale. And that is what I want to talk about is the formation of structure, large scale structure in the universe from the time of the beginning of the current universe as we know it, starting with the Big Bang uh, to the present time. And uh, the fact is, over the past 25 years, tremendous advances have been made in addressing this question of how did we get here from starting out with a very hot, dense plasma in the Big Bang? And it's due to three factors, I would say. One, large, very large ground-based telescopes, uh, most of which are situated either in Chile or on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, a space telescope, a very important one that you see on the screen behind me, Hubble Space Telescope, which is a really unique facility, and 
the high technology supercomputers, which have enabled us to take mountains of data and actually interpret them. So those three factors working together have really caused us to go from a point where even as I was a professor earlier in my career, uh, not understanding exactly how it is that current galaxies form from the homogeneous state in the Big Bang to the point now where for the first time astronomers have a really good idea of how we started with the situation right after the Big Bang and ended up with what we actually observed when we look up at the night sky, stars, planets, and galaxies. So Hubble Space Telescope, which has been my good fortune to be associated with now for more than 25 years, uh, has been an important part of this. So let me say something about Hubble Space Telescope because uh, in, in itself is as uh, marvelous as what I would say is our ability to interpret physical processes over the 14 billion years since the Big Bang occurred. And this slide really says it all. So on the left, you see an image taken from one of the largest ground-based telescopes, an eight-meter uh, telescope of a cloudy region. And on the right, what you see is a Hubble telescope image of the same region, Hubble mirror being much smaller than the eight-meter ground-based mirror. And you can see that the spatial resolution is at least 10 times better. And the reason is obvious, at least I think, and that is when you're beneath the Earth's atmosphere, that blurs the light. And so you want to be above the atmosphere if you want a clear view of the universe. And of course, the fact that you can get much better spatial resolution means that you can see much fainter objects. You can distinguish things that would be fuzzy if you observe them only from the ground. <clears throat> and since you can see fainter, that means you can see further out in the universe. So space is really the place where we want to be. Um, it's expensive to operate there. But the fact is, the discoveries that have come from this telescope really, I think, justify uh, its existence. So a word on how it operates. Hubble is in low Earth orbit, what we call LEO, low Earth orbit, uh, 600 kilometers, roughly 380 miles up above the Earth's atmosphere. It is the highest orbit that that telescope, which completely filled the shuttle bay, it's the largest thing we could put in the shuttle, that's the highest orbit that we could achieve with it. But fortunately, it's above 99.99% of the Earth's atmosphere, so it's a great place to do astronomy. Uh, it's got a bunch of instruments on it. Its, it's uh, structure, optically, is just like a normal ground-based telescope. Uh, we gather data 24 hours a day with it because, of course, you don't have the atmosphere, and so the sky is dark up there. So the thing operates night and day. It collects data, stores it on uh, uh, digital computers, which are uploaded to a uh, geosynchronous uh, uh, satellite, the so-called TIDRIS satellite that you see there in the upper left, about six or seven times a day, which then downloads the data to White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico, which then fiber optically sends it over to Goddard Space Flight Center, which is the NASA center that basically has control of the Hubble. Uh, and they then microwave it to our institute in Baltimore, which is about 40 miles away from, from Goddard, and uh, where I've had uh, uh, my position for the past 25 years or so. Our institute, Space Telescope Science Institute, STSCI as we call it, uh, is in charge of the science operations of that telescope. Goddard takes care of the bird, uh, as we refer to it, the, the telescope. But we take care of all the science aspects of it. And we massage the data. We write software that helps astronomers uh, do something with it. And then we send it out to them. And so the science that comes out of it uh, results from that particular process. When the, and the telescope is, uh, was launched in April 1990, which means this coming April, it will have been up there working for 30 years. First 20 years of existence, it was serviced every three to four years by the uh, space shuttle. But when the space shuttle was retired 10 years ago, since that time, there have been no servicing missions. 
And I'm happy to say that the telescope, in spite of the hostile environment, space environment that it's in, uh, continues to operate uh, beautifully. There is a decay of the detectors. It's uh, no way to prevent that. So its sensitivity is not quite what it was when it was launched, but the fact is, today, tonight, it is producing good data. Wasn't always that way. This is an image, the first image that was taken with a telescope. Um, about two months after launch, after uh, the systems had been brought up, <coughs> the telescope was out gas because uh, you can't start operating with it uh, with the out gassing going on because that could coat the mirror and, and do bad things to it. Um, when we first looked at this image, we realized that something was wrong and the reason uh, that is the case is because it was supposed to produce an image like that rather than the one that you see there on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and when we looked at the magnified images of the stars that were in that picture, they had the image with this big halo around it that you see in the lower right. It was clear that the telescope suffered from a serious optical aberration. And uh, this was bad news because at that time, for the 25 years of the development of the telescope uh, until the time it was uh, uh, operating in 1990, the cost was two billion dollars, making it the most scientific, uh, sorry, the most expensive 